Yeah, hello from my side. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm super happy to have the possibility to speak here and give you a lot, uh, like a, a rough overview of how, how Bitcoin works. And um, yeah, I quickly to my, um, my name is Veronica Kutt. I work at the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center here um, as a research assistant. And my main focus is on uh, Bitcoin actually and on self-sovereign identity. Yeah mathematics like worked in real estate and just like nearly two years ago I stumbled up on Bitcoin and it kind of blew my mind what new system is evolving there and my kind of like what I want to achieve today is not I, I don't have a big like financial background like all these people downstairs yeah so I just want to want to give you um, an input of what's going on there and also the, the thought that you're like really willing to open up your mental like system because probably what's going to happen in the next 10, 15, 20 years with our financial system is something that we cannot um, imagine at the moment at all. The same way as we couldn't imagine what the internet will do to the way we interact with each other like 20 years ago. So, um, yeah, um, I brought like a short quote for the beginning from World Economic Forum. It says, blockchain, this new global computational architecture could rewire commerce and transform how society operates, becoming one of the most significant innovations since the creation of the internet. Yeah. And I think we've seen a lot of hype, especially in the last year around like cryptocurrencies and this blockchain technology. And the, the big, big question is, where does this hype come from? Because at the moment we have more the situation that people are like looking for problems that can apply blockchain to. Yeah, this was what's, what was happening in the last year. But the big question is, where did this hype come from? There must have been a problem that was actually solved by blockchain or let's say by Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is by now one of the few really like working implementation. And um, another quote is saying, uh, blockchain will do to the financial system what the internet did to media. Has anyone heard that one before? It's like, I wanna ask you, well, well, what is it actually what the internet did to media? It totally. It's all gone. And, and I think the biggest thing, what we have to think about, like 20 years ago, it was all the distribution of information was completely centralized. We had like universities, we had like, uh, like professors, we had like some authors of books, we had like TV, uh, state TV channels, a couple of sources that were distributing information and to actually um, um, build information and distribute it to, to the world, yeah? It was super difficult because you have to, had to be like in, in kind of a, um, kind of have a, a reputation before. And nowadays, it's like everyone is able to even distribute the information via his own TV channel through, let's say, YouTube or Instagram. If someone had told you 20 years ago that it's possible that every single person here in this room is able to do his own TV channel yeah, with a supercomputer in his pocket, people would have said, hey, you're nuts. Yeah? So let's imagine what's going to happen in the next uh, years. And the big question, like I said, is like, what problem has been solved actually by, by blockchain or Bitcoin? Does anyone know? It's um, the double spend problem. So, um, so far when we are talking about like digital information um, and sending a file, let's say I'm sending a file to Max. Yeah, what's happening at the moment is that I'm not really sending the, the original, but I'm rather sending a copy of that file. Yeah, 
If, if I'm sending a, a, a PDF, he has the PDF, I have the PDF. And this is no problem of, at all if it's about like um, Word documents or pictures. And I'm, and I'm fine with having a digital file copied. But we're having a problem when it's about digital value, when it's about money. When I'm sending a max, I want to make sure that this U doesn't get copied. Yeah? I have to send him the original file. And this problem hasn't been solved in information technology until the invention of Bitcoin. Yeah? And you might say, hey, but Veronica, we, we have, we can transfer digital value. We have this possibility. Yeah, we do have, but the solution today, we, we, we can do that. But we need a trusted intermediary. We need Visa, or MasterCard, all that. The only possibility, technically, to send digital value is a trusted intermediary. Groundbreaking information. It was the same in Some people said, Okay, we can now send information digitally. And some people were like, ah, yeah, okay, but people are not tech savvy and this computer thing, they won't, won't have this large machine in their homes and it will only be for businesses. This was what people thought about like email and, and sending information digitally, 1995. But it was a game changer information and some people realized that the fact that we can send information digitally for nearly no cost and instantly is a groundbreaking new tool we have. And the same thing we do have now with the fact that we can send digital you without an intermediary. It's a groundbreaking new information we have. The big question is, okay, I, I have to, uh, we always have a single point of failure when you have trusted intermediaries. Many people in the world, I think it's around 2, 2.5 billion, don't have any access to the financial system. And what I think is way more important is like the whole ownership um, data and uh, uh, control of, of data. Yeah? And I just read an article just before I came here. Um, China wants to get the social uh, scoring point system social credit, um, I mean, they're in control of all the data and everything. It, it will be kind of 1984, but even worse, yeah? What's gonna happen in the future? So at a, like, really, well, time of history, because we really, who control of our data? Should it be big trusted intermediaries? Or, and now as we have the possibility to send and, and be in control of, of digital value, shouldn't it be us? The big question is though, now I, I was talking a bit of, ah, okay, century controlled data. Another uh, quote I brought is like uh, from Leo Wies. Uh, he tweeted in April, amazing how people suddenly reala realize they don't own their data on Facebook. Let's see how they react when they find out they don't own their money in their bank accounts either. Until two years ago, to be honest, I never really thought about it. That I only have access to my money, but I'm not really in control of it. And I think most of the people, we, we kind of know we don't own our data. We kind of know that we don't own our money, but we're not aware of it. And now we have a new possibility. We have a new technical feature which makes it possible to regain that control. How is it possible? 2008, it was uh, the birth of Bitcoin, like the white paper came out. I can highly, highly, highly recommend to read. It's like five, six pages long, the white paper of Bitcoin. And um, it's like kind of, kind of easy to understand, actually. And I can highly recommend to read into that paper. The interesting, interesting thing is this whole system was in, uh, invented by Satoshi Nakamoto. No one really knows if it's a person, a group, or... Probably female, though. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, 
the interesting uh, thing is, like in Bitcoin, there was actually nothing was invented newly. There is no new cryptography, no new nothing. What Satoshi Nakamoto did is to put a couple of pieces very, very, in a very clever way together, like in a game theoretical way. And the three building blocks of that system, I'd say the first one is decentralization. What does it actually mean? Sending Max, a it's my bank, probably you all know way better how it works, yeah? It's different like banks in between in this transaction. What it means in a, on a decentralized ledger to send a euro to Max, yeah? In Bitcoin, let's say. It means that every single person of you in this room is writing down that Veronica has one euro less and Max has one euro more. Every single person in this room. And if Max came up now and he'd be like, uh, sorry, Veronica, I never received that euro. I'd be like, sorry, can you please have a look at all these sheets? And in this room, maybe it would be possible for Max to convince half of you to write down something different on your sheet. But if you imagine these papers being computers all around the world, all around the world, so-called nodes in Bitcoin, it's around 10,000 by now, yeah? It's impossible to tamper with this transaction, yeah? I'm sending a euro to Max, 10,000 nodes around the world are writing that down. Really impossible to tamper with this transaction. This is the first point. We really have to, to, to understand what it means to have a decentralized ledger, which is like held by a community. And the next point is, if we imagine like the first example, okay, I'm doing a transaction in this room with Max and um, everyone is writing down or everyone here in this room is doing transactions and everyone is writing them down. Do you think we'd have the same things like written on that paper in the end? I think so. And if we imagine 10,000 computers all around the world, it's super difficult that we have the same ledger. And this is, there is a so-called, it's called proof of work consensus mechanism in Bitcoin, which is like people have to kind of invest, phys like invest energy to prove that they are led to, to like um, confirm the transaction, kind of, yeah? They put energy into that. And as soon as they won kind of this mathematical um, puzzle, they're allowed to to publish that transaction, everyone has to write it down. However, it's just about we make sure that everyone writes down the same thing in the ledger. And the next point is, let's be honest, when I'm doing a transaction with Max, I'm sending him a euro now. Who of you would be interested in that? No one, probably. So why don't you write that down? You wouldn't bother to write that down, maybe you'd bother if there was an economic incentive for writing out down that transaction. So this is total. It's kind of like Bitcoin works. We have an open decentralized ledger. Everyone without permission can do transactions and um, have them confirmed by the network. The whole network worldwide and set up a node and be part of that network. Every single person here in that room. So this decentralized ledger and the nodes who are firming the transactions and, and keeping that ledger, they are getting incentives for doing that. So it's like a game theoretically community driven system. Yeah. Um, it's they get Bitcoin in. Exactly, but the, 
um, that doesn't need uh, much of his incentive is he needs to have an updated uh, blockchain to take part in the next like um, round yeah so as soon as as someone won the lottery kind of thing it's a it's not a lottery actually whatever um, uh, as soon as someone won this he can he says okay these are the transactions everyone has to write them down so everyone adds the block to their blockchain to keep on mining on the next block but the writing down does need lots of energy the um, the linking of one block to another this is the what takes a lot a lot of energy this immutable linking of two blocks yeah yeah Um, that just a couple of people verify one transaction um, because it has to um, if you if you want to do a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain your transaction get in, gets into a, like a so-called meme pool which is like a big pool of transactions and every node every one of these 10,000 computers can see this transaction you cannot just do a transaction like without the network seeing it kind of yeah so it's always seen by everyone and then the fastest to confirm, and then it's included in a block. You cannot just confirm one transaction. All the transactions get bundled in blocks, and then the whole block has to be verified by the network. It has to, they have to kind of find a, a, a digital fingerprint kind of thing, which fulfills certain criteria to say it, yeah? But it's not possible to verify just one transaction. It's always the whole network yeah, doing that. And it's always like viewed and by by the whole network. Yeah, it's a totally different. Um, okay, the the result of this whole thing is financial sovereignty. It's the first time in human history after I don't know. I mean, if we exclude cash, yeah, cash, we're we're financial like sovereign, but with everything else, we have access to the numbers and the accounts, and we get money. Yeah, and we already heard this morning that like the future is painted kind of like dark from by some people who have like really knowledge in this space. So um, the the result is financial sovereignty. And um, what do we have with that is not just we cannot just um, transfer like money, which is already a big thing, but all kinds of value in the future and um, Value will be like transferred as quickly and seamlessly as information in the future. Okay, short, short wrap up. What we have with Bitcoin is an open system. Everyone has access to this system. Everyone can do transactions on it. Everyone can confirm transactions on this network. And there is no central control. It's impossible to just like shut down some accounts or anything. Uh, the whole decentralized so we have a decentralized ledger which is like written which is kept by kind of a big big group and in, in the world um, it's community driven it's a neutral pa platform it's a borderless platform so we have it doesn't matter if I if I'm doing a transaction with Max if he if his account is like in in Japan or in Germany or wherever yeah this whole system is is borderless and to be honest when I see how the world is de evolving and we're having way more like globalized structures I kind of see the whole thing of like state issued current I mean Norman you might think like oh this uh, it's it's kind of not working i think with or it, it feels like kind of a traditional system for me to be honest and i i totally have no problem with like a computer coded um hmm? borderless which is community driven and i think the people the, even the, the younger people they have even less of a problem with something like that yeah um hmm? 
No, Bitcoin. I was doing the example. As soon as you, uh, when you're using that system, this is all Bitcoin. Yeah? It's always a Bitcoin. Yeah, I should have said. And the whole thing is censorship resistant because there is a central point of control or Um, Angebot und Nachfrage, wie sagt man das auf Englisch? Demand and supply, I'd say. Yeah. Um, it's the same with gold and with, with everything in the end. Yeah, how, how does it, yeah. I mean, gold, the same. The question is if it's really worth, like, yeah. If people start believing in, in coded money, which is like inflation um, secure, because we see in the code how many coins, and this is on average 12.5 bitcoins at the moment, but it's becoming less and less in the future. But you can exactly see in the code how many bitcoins are created in the future. Yeah? Um, and if it, it, it could be changed, but only if 80 or 90% of the whole community is d'accord with this decision. Yeah. And then it's okay, I think, to change the financial system. If everyone is all right with that. If not, we, are, we can be 100% sure that we exactly know how many bitcoins, how much money is created in the future with this one. Um, and I have a very, very yeah. Um, whole message I want to give you is like, when we look back, what happened now? Some people think they send information digitally. Most people said, hey, you're, you're crazy. If, if we had told them that we have supercomputers in our pockets and we can do live streaming on the street and video talking, that at 20 years ago, people would have said, hey, you're nuts. And we have to see that Nowadays, we already have the base layer of the internet and we already have like a huge community of developers. Yeah. So what happened in the last 20 years, what already kind of blew all our minds, a, a very fast development actually. This will be, this kind of development happened in the next 12 years. And it was also not the post offices who started to implement email. It was completely new structures evolving. There hasn't been anything like social media before. And what we are trying to do at the moment is like, hey, we have our financial system. Ah, oh, there is something new. Oh, let's cut down a couple of the main properties and try to squeeze it into the traditional system. And my gut feeling is telling me, this won't work. This will be new financial structures and new business cases evolving, and they'll scale it speed we haven't seen before. Yeah. What's my dream? Yeah. Exactly, but the so um, you're in in general. I think you're, you're talking about mining centralization. What happens if a big group has um, a big amount of power and can actually uh, confirm their own transactions? Yeah, and fake ones. Uh, computing power actually in Bitcoin is is by now that high that this will is impossible on one hand on the other hand we have to say there are a, bit, a couple of like large mining pools in 
large mining farms in China if they cooperated, like if they collaborated. It would be possible actually for them to compromise the system. But the incentive for them to do that, yeah, if they did that, if they compromised like one transaction, and um, this would break down the whole system. And they invested like millions, not to say billions of, of like real world money into, into hardware equipment to set up these mining farms. So um, I, um, because as soon Bitcoin is, the, by, by the way, Bitcoin is the first system ever, uh, IT system that has never been hacked so far. If there are hacks, it's centralized exchanges. Yeah, that are, uh, for example, exchanging like fiat money to crypto money. Um, but Bitcoin itself has never been hacked in its whole history. And it, it's like getting the biggest like attacks uh, from, from hackers. Yeah. And if, if Bitcoin was hacked, it would go like crack down. Yeah, the last one, yeah. Why don't you think But they'd find out in a second because everyone's watching. It's the same as if, if you'd say, okay, also like JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and so on, they could uh, collaborate and actually um, compromise the transactions. They could, but. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they do. For, okay, <laughs> next topic. Um, anyway, what, what, okay, very, very quick. Yeah, uh, very quick. To the amount of energy at the moment, one transaction, uh, one Bitcoin transaction um, needs a huge, huge amount of energy. I think it's the same amount as like seven houses need for a whole day. It's a huge amount, but we have to see if we what, what do it. They're starting to build different layers on top of Bitcoin. We think about what a gold, a physical proper gold transaction is from here to New York, for example. Let's say I have gold. I have to go to my gold person now physically and he sends it to New York. We'd say gold is pretty shit, yeah? What we do is we don't do the physical gold transactions, we build layers on top. And at the moment we have this tamper-proof, incredible genius system, which is absolutely secure. And now we're starting and the activity is super, super high in the whole Bitcoin uh, space. They're starting to build different layers on where we have like instant and kind of um, costless transactions in the future. So the status quo was the status in five years, I think. No way. But this is the very beginning. This is the, the secure base layer, which will probably only be there for like huge transactions in the future. Yeah. But at the moment, to be honest, yeah, yeah I think, no, I think um, we should, yeah. Anyway, change. Quickly, revolution, revolution, I don't know, but try to, this whole new thing will probably not fit into our traditional box.